Good afternoon, colleagues. Our first item of business is First Minister's questions. Uh, and before we turn to questions, I think the First Minister will give us an update on the situation with COVID. First Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I will shortly confirm the different levels of protection to be applied across Scotland from Monday and briefly explain some of the reasoning behind these decisions. A detailed analysis paper is also being published which sets out our assessment of each of the five factors and our overall judgment for each local authority area. First of all, I'll give an update on today's statistics. The total number of positive cases reported yesterday was 1,128. That is 7.1% of people newly uh, of total tests and takes the total number of cases to 61,531. 416 of the new cases were in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, 266 in Lanarkshire, 121 in Ayrshire and Arran, and 117 in Lothian. The remaining cases were spread across nine other health board areas. Only Shetland had no new cases reported. I can also confirm that 1,152 people are in hospital. That is an increase of 35 from yesterday. 86 people are in intensive care. That is one more than yesterday. And I deeply regret to say that in the past 24 hours, a further 37 deaths have been registered of patients who first tested positive over the previous 28 days. That means the total number of deaths under that measurement is now 2,791. And again, I want to send my deepest condolences to all those who have lost a loved one to this illness. These figures show that we are still seeing high numbers of new cases, increasing hospital and ICU admissions, and sadly, a rising number of deaths. These issues are not unique to Scotland. We have, of course, seen a resurgence in the virus in all parts of the UK, across Europe and right around the world. Uh, just last night, for example, both France and Germany reimposed nationwide lockdowns. In Scotland, we acted early with some difficult but necessary measures, and we hope that this will have the effect of slowing the spread and preventing a further deterioration in our position. And while we can't be certain and certainly have no grounds for complacency, we do see some encouraging signs that this might be the case. Last week, I indicated that we were beginning to see a significant slowing in the rate at which new cases are increasing. And I can confirm that this has continued. Cases in the past week up to today have increased by 4%. Two weeks ago, the weekly increase was 40%. And our latest estimate of the R number published today suggests that it is still above 1, but may have fallen slightly to one3 all of this suggests that the measures introduced five weeks ago to curb household meetings are having an effect and the additional measures introduced three weeks ago to significantly restrict hospitality may also be starting to have an impact. All of that, of course, is down to the sacrifices of people the length and breadth of the country. Uh, but we must be under no illusions. Europe is now firmly in the grip of a second wave of COVID. Cases here at home are still rising, albeit the rate of growth appears to be slowing. And the virus is still highly infectious. It will take every opportunity to spread. So unless we act individually and collectively to protect and build on the progress we see today, it will quickly go into reverse. Our strategic framework aims to tackle the virus with measures strong enough to work, but also proportionate to the scale of the problem in different parts of the country and in a way that minimises as far as possible the other harms that the pandemic is causing. The assessment of what level of protection is right for each local authority is broadly based on five key factors. The number of positive cases per 100,000 people over the most recent week, the percentage of positive tests, our forecast for new cases in the weeks ahead, and the capacity both of local hospitals and intensive care facilities. These factors are assessed alongside the views of local public health officials and with a consideration of local circumstances such as specific outbreaks, travel and work patterns and the extent to which health services are provided by neighbouring health boards. And our final decisions are based on all of these factors. Before setting out our decisions, I want to take a moment to remind people of the purpose of each level. The baseline level zero and level one are intended to ensure as much normality as possible, but they do not remove all restrictions. The protections in place at these levels should enable communities to control outbreaks quickly and effectively and minimise transmission of the virus by following the guidance and supporting each other to comply. However, when we begin to see community transmission in an area and when the spread of the virus can't be linked to specific outbreaks, we need to apply the breaks. And that is essentially what levels two and three are designed to do. 
Our aim is that these restrictions, especially in level three, are in place for as short a time as possible. Uh, so if any area is at level three, our aim collectively between those who live there, the local authority, local health services and local businesses must be to bring it down to level two and then level one, not to allow it to drift to level four. Uh, and we will use uh, level four when transmission is extremely high and risking the capacity of the NHS to cope. Uh, let me turn now to the levels that will apply across the country from Monday at 6 a.m. And following this initial assessment, let me also uh, point out that we will review on a weekly basis whether any changes uh, are required. We aim to confirm our decisions to Parliament on a Tuesday with the changes coming into force on the following Friday. Barring the need for any changes before then, our next update will therefore be Tuesday the 10th of November with any changes coming into effect on the 13th of November. Before turning to today's decision, let me remind everyone that you can see on the Scottish Government website the reasoning behind these decisions, what level your own area is in and what restrictions that entails for the area you live in. Given the fragile situation we face and the fact that we are migrating to this new system for the first time, we are taking a deliberately cautious approach today. At present, we do not judge it safe or prudent to place any part of the country into the baseline level zero. However, if we see continued progress, I hope that might change. I hope that will change in the weeks ahead. However, I can confirm that Highland, Murray, the Western Isles, Orkney and Shetland have all been assessed as level one. In time, hopefully a short time, we expect that level one to allow people to meet in each other's homes in groups of up to six people from a maximum of two households. However, at present, on clear public health advice, the restriction on household meetings will continue to apply in all parts of the country for now. I'm conscious that in our more rural and island communities, that restriction can cause particular difficulty. So we will review the necessity of it in level one areas ahead of the 10th November review. If the virus remains controlled in these areas, I am hopeful that we will be able to lift it then. Let me now address those areas that have been assessed as level two. They are Aberdeenshire, Aberdeen, Fife, The Borders, Dumfries and Galloway, Argyll and Butte, and also, as I'll come on to discuss in more detail in a moment, Perth and Kinross and Angus. In two of these cases, The Borders and Argyll and Butte, the decision on whether they should be assessed as level one or level two was finely balanced. In both cases, one of the key factors in reaching our decision was the interconnection with neighbouring areas, particularly with health services in Lothian and Greater Glasgow and Clyde. We have also considered the impact of travel from nearby areas with higher prevalence of COVID. As a result, we have decided to take a cautious approach by applying level two to both areas. We will, however, consider this decision very carefully at the next review point. The interconnection with neighbouring areas and services has also heavily influenced our decision on Inverclyde. I understand why it would wish to be assessed as level two. However, we do not consider it safe to take that decision yet, given the very close connections between Inverclyde and other parts of West Central Scotland, with high transmission rates, high positivity levels and significant pressure already on hospital and ICU capacity. Inverclyde has therefore been assessed as level three, along with East and West Dumbartonshire, Renfrewshire and East Renfrewshire and the city of Glasgow, South Ayrshire, East Ayrshire and North Ayrshire, Stirling, Falkirk and Clackmannanshire, the city of Edinburgh, Midlothian, West Lothian and East Lothian. We know that these areas in level three have been under restrictions now for a number of weeks, particularly on household interaction. Based on the data we are considering, if progress in suppressing the virus is maintained, we would hope that at a very early review point, we will be able to consider moving some areas, I think East Lothian in particular, and possibly Edinburgh from level three to level two uh, reasonably soon. I cannot make that commitment now, but I hope we will be able to confirm it in the coming weeks. Our approach to managing COVID will work best when there is real partnership working between neighbouring authorities and health boards on how to drive down levels of infection, share resources and communicate with and support communities. I indicated earlier this week that we had cause for concern in relation to Dundee and that we expected it to move into level three. Dundee is currently seeing per week around 185 new cases per 100,000 of the population. That is higher than for several of the areas already in the equivalent of level three. We have therefore decided that a level three assessment for Dundee is the correct one. And so from Monday at 6 a.m., Dundee will move into level three. 
Support is available for businesses which will be required to close and all businesses across Scotland will have access to the replacement job support scheme from the UK Government which begins on Monday. I would encourage all businesses in Dundee who are impacted by closure and those in the supply chain to engage with the City Council and also to look at the findbusinesssupport.gov.scot website to find out what help is available. In fact, businesses across the country can access that resource. In making this decision, we considered very carefully whether Perth and Kinross and Angus should also be placed in level three, given travel patterns and interdependencies between these three authorities. Our decision not to do so at this stage is based on the view of the three authorities, NHS Tayside and the police that close partnership working can mitigate against cross-border transmission. People living in Angus and Perth and Kinross have a big part to play though. It will be essential for them to adhere strictly to the guidance and the restrictions, especially on travel, if a rise in cases that would necessitate level three restrictions being applied across all of Tayside is to be avoided. Siding officer, let me turn now uh, to the situation in Lanarkshire. The decision between level three and level four there has been very finely balanced. Lanarkshire has a high number of cases and a high test positivity and a high number of patients in hospital and ICU. However, there is evidence in recent days that the situation is stabilising and that is undoubtedly down to the compliance and sacrifices of local people. And the local councils, NHS Lanarkshire and the police believe they have strong partnership plans in place to maintain that progress under current restrictions. For these reasons, and given the severity of Level 4 restrictions, we have decided that North and South Lanarkshire should remain in Level 3 at present. However, I want to be very clear that this has been a borderline decision, and it is one that we require to keep under review, not just weekly, but on a daily basis. I would appeal, therefore, to people across Lanarkshire to continue to play your part. Please abide strictly with all the rules and guidance to help ensure that the rise in cases continues to slow and that more severe restrictions can be avoided. Second officer, let me turn finally to travel. And here, I need to be very blunt. I know travel restrictions are unwelcome and can be controversial, but they are an absolutely essential part of any regional approach to tackling COVID. They are, unfortunately, a price we pay for more targeted restrictions. If people don't abide by the travel advice, the virus will spread from high to lower prevalence areas and a differentiated approach will become unsustainable. In these circumstances, we would have to return to national restrictions. So let me be clear what we are asking of people at this stage. If you live in a level three council area or in future a level four area, please do not travel outside the council area you live in unless you require to do so for essential reasons. And if you live in a level one or two local authority area, you must not travel into a level three or level four area except for essential purposes. By essential purposes, we mean things like work, if you cannot work from home, education, local outdoor exercise, health care or caring responsibilities and essential shopping where that is not possible locally. In recent weeks, that guidance has applied to health board areas, but from Monday it will apply at local authority level. Similarly, people, wherever they live, should not travel between Scotland and areas in the rest of the UK with high levels of the virus unless it is essential. Now, given that the police can't check everyone's journey, this has to rely on public willingness to adhere. That's why the advice is in guidance at this stage and not regulation, but we will keep that under review. But I appeal to people across the country, please comply with this advice to keep everyone safe and allow us to continue, if possible, with a proportionate response uh, across different parts of the country uh, to wider restrictions. Signing officer, the levels we will put in place from Monday require more sacrifice at a time when all of us are tired of making these sacrifices. I recognise that and I again thank everyone across Scotland for everything they are doing. But these sacrifices continue to be essential. If we all dig in and stick with it, this proportionate approach has a real chance of being sustainable and keeping COVID under control over the winter. If we succeed, we open the prospect in all parts of the country of being able to lead slightly less restricted lives in the future, hopefully in the reasonably near future. However, the other side of this uh, is equally true, and I must be open with Parliament and with the country about it. We are, as of now, making progress in Scotland, but cases are still rising and the situation we face is fragile. Across Europe, the pandemic is accelerating. 
so I cannot rule out a move back to nationwide restrictions in the next few weeks, including at level four. That could happen if, for example, cases in part of the country start to rise faster again, to the extent that controlling spread with travel restrictions will not be effective. Or it could happen if pressure on the NHS risks breaching capacity, not just at a local level, but overall. We want to avoid this, obviously, but to achieve that, we must all play our part. The government must and will lead, but all of us have individual agency and all of us have individual responsibility. None of us can guarantee we will not get or transmit the virus, but we can all make choices that keep ourselves, our loved ones and our communities safer. So please make sure you know the restrictions in your local area. From Monday, a postcode checker will help you do that. And please stick to these restrictions. Wherever you live for now, do not visit other people's houses and don't travel to or from level three areas. And please remember to wear face coverings, avoid places with crowds of people, clean your hands and surfaces, keep two metres distance from people in other households and self-isolate and get tested immediately if you have COVID symptoms. If we do these things, we have a chance of keeping the virus under control in our neighbourhoods and our communities. We can reduce overall case levels in our own areas and help to do so across the country. And then we can all play a part in moving all parts of the country to lower levels of restrictions. And above all, presiding officer, we can protect each other, protect our national health service and save lives. Thank you very much, First Minister. We're going to turn now to questions. I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question of the First Minister to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's clear that we are now in the grip of a second wave, but today I want to talk about the first wave and the devastating Public Health Scotland report into care home COVID deaths. Yesterday, the First Minister said, I'm not trying just to pick on specific lines but she had already selectively picked her line from the report. She quoted, overall, the analysis does not find statistical evidence that hospital discharges were associated with care home outbreaks. Of course, the First Minister chose not to read the next line. It said there was a relatively wide variation in the estimated levels of risk. So can the First Minister now tell us how high might the true risk have been of putting known COVID positive patients into care homes. First Minister. President Officer, can I uh, begin by recognising again uh, the toll COVID has taken on people in care homes? Uh, the fact that that is not unique to Scotland does not in any way detract from the distress and the grief that has been caused. And I want to say again today that I am deeply sorry uh, for that. The position on testing uh, changed in line with evidence and advice. That was true in Scotland, it was true in other parts of the UK. Uh, but the absence of testing did not equate to an absence of action. Uh, guidance was in place all along that was designed to minimise the risks in care homes. Uh, but we continue to learn lessons, we continue to apply these lessons and we continue to take uh, with the utmost seriousness the duty on government uh, to do everything possible to protect the general population and particularly those who are most vulnerable. Um, yesterday, and I, uh, you know, it's, it's for other people to judge, I, I don't know that people watching uh, all of uh, the, the hour or more I spent answering questions on this yesterday would have concluded that I tried to hide any aspect of this. This is a difficult situation for families and for the public generally. I quoted the conclusion of the report, uh, but this report has hard messages for us. It tells us some of what uh, we think uh, are factors in driving outbreaks in care homes, but there is work still to do to understand this. And of course, we have the information uh, now uh, that the report gives us because we commissioned this report. Similar things have happened in other countries where we still don't have this level of information. I am determined we continue to learn and apply lessons um, and do everything we can to pe keep people in our care homes safe um, and to keep the general public as safe as we possibly can. Ruth Davison. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but it didn't address the specific question that I put to her, which was what was the increased risk? When somebody tested positive for COVID before being transferred to a care home, the report said that the best estimate was a 45% increase in risk of an outbreak. But because of the wide variation I, I quoted, the risk could have been much higher. In fact, the report says it could have been as high as 374%. A 300 and 74% increase in risk of seeing COVID rip through a care home. This is exactly why we need the public inquiry to start now, because there is so much we still don't know. 
What we do know is that only 13.5% of care homes who were never sent any patients ended up having an outbreak. That jumped to 38% when a home had one or more patients put into their care. But we still don't know how high that number goes when a care home had a known COVID positive patient sent to them. That's pretty basic stuff. Why was that number left out of the report? First Minister. Uh, this was a report that was done independently of government. Public Health Scotland uh, published the report, but the report was contributed to by academics who are entirely independent. They conducted uh, a briefing with journalists yesterday to explain in, in more detail their methodology and their findings. I don't think this report is the last word on these issues. I, I have never thought that. Uh, there is much more work to be done to understand uh, the issues that uh, were factors in care home outbreaks. Uh, this report tells us some of that, but it does not tell us all of that. Uh, of course, this report gives us much more information than is available in any other part of the UK. And I hope we will see this uh, depth of understanding develop in countries elsewhere so that we can learn from each other as well as from our own experiences. Um, the uh, overall conclusion of the report is as I quoted yesterday, um, but I, I recognised yesterday that in terms of the different scenarios, whether uh, somebody tested positive, tested ne negative or were not tested at all, while the report said that in all of these scenarios there was not statistical evidence that hospital discharges were associated with outbreaks, it did say, and I recognised that, that yesterday, that uh, there was a, a variation in that, the confidence of that across these different scenarios. Uh, but what the report did say, of course, is, and I'm quoting from page 41 of it, uh, is that the risk of an outbreak associated with care home size is much larger than any plausible risk from a hospital uh, discharge. Now, what that says is that while we must continue to consider the issues around discharges, we also have to look at the other factors, and the Health Secretary will talk more about this week, uh, this next week in Parliament uh, when she sets out uh, winter planning for social care. Um, I take all of these issues extremely seriously. I have given a commitment. Um, again, you know, I have done this uh, before many uh, other countries have. There will be a full public inquiry. That full public inquiry will look at the issues of care homes. We are in the grip of a second wave of COVID. I think it is right that we enable everybody who has a part to play to focus on getting the country through that. Um, I was struck uh, by comments this morning from Professor June Andrews, who will be familiar to many people across this chamber, uh, when she was asked about the timing of a public inquiry. And she said, uh, it's far too soon now. We've got far too many things to do to keep the system going, to keep people well. There is no doubt there will be a public inquiry. But at the moment, we will continue uh, we will content I, 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 just for the avoidance of doubt, uh, Presiding Officer, June Andrews will also have said things critical of the government. I am not trying uh, to uh, depart from that at all. Uh, there will be a full public inquiry when the time for that is right, when we have got the country through uh, this next stage of COVID. But as we go, as we have done all along, we will continue to learn and apply lessons in care homes. Um, and that's a responsibility all of us in government take very seriously. Ruth Davison. I'm not sure the best defence against elective quoting is to selectively quote what Professor June Andrews said on the radio this morning. It was devastating to this government. And the calculation yesterday appears to have been that by publishing yesterday's report, any pressure to speed up or bring forward that public inquiry would ease. And I believe that the opposite is the case and because of the way that yesterday's report was handled. It was delayed by a month. It was given to ministers privately on Monday. It was only released to the media 15 minutes before questions and with a press release issued that didn't even bother to mention known COVID positive patients being sent to care homes in the first place. And the very last people to get this report of all, to get sight of it, were the families and loved ones of those who died. We already know that a crucial line in Public Health Scotland's briefing to journalists, the briefing the First Minister just mentioned, that it was likely that hospital discharges are the source of introduction of infection in a small number of cases was missing from the final report. Does the First Minister really think that the delay, the spin and the sleight of hand surrounding this report serves those grieving families well? First Minister. I, I don't expect grieving families uh, to be um, assured or to have all of their concerns satisfied by, by any report. And, and I don't think this report is the only uh, or the final word. It was a, a report that was commissioned by the Scottish Government. Um, I, I would say again that we are the only government in the UK so far to commission a report of this depth. Um, and I think that 
Wales is the only government that has done anything to look at this issue, but that was a, a report, as I understand it, based on statistical modelling, not on actual data. Uh, so that is important. The, the timing of it was down to Public Health Scotland and they consulted with the Statistics Authority given the complexity of bringing the different data sets together. As with all official statistics, the date of publication was pre-announced. Um, and you know, in terms of the timing of it, I, I answer questions uh, every single day um, at the moment. There is no shortage of opportunities to, to scrutinise me rightly and properly. This report does not change, in my view, uh, the, the arguments one way or another on a public inquiry. As I said yesterday, I expected this report to say something different than what it did um, on hospital discharges. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, a public inquiry is necessary. Um, and until that point, it is also necessary that we continue to deepen our understanding and take the actions that are necessary, just as we did back in April when, in light of changing advice and evidence, we moved to uh, testing of uh, discharges to care homes, just as we later moved to uh, routinely test all workers in care homes. We announced last week plans to extend that into designated visitors and other uh, routine visitors to care homes. We are learning and applying that learning on an ongoing basis. Um, I, there are no words I will ever find to convey the depth of my regret at what happened in care homes. Um, and I take possibly more seriously than I take anything else, including any other aspect uh, of our handling of this pandemic, uh, the need to ensure that we learn lessons where we got things wrong, that we don't shy away from that. But more than anything, we take all possible steps to keep those in our care homes safe. Ruth Davison. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday's report was stuffed full of numbers and statistics, but fundamentally this isn't about stats, it's about people. The people who lost their lives and the people that they left behind. People like Sandra O'Neill, who you said yesterday of her lost mum, the thought that she was on her own with a sense of drowning is the last thing I think about at night, and it's the first thing I think about in the morning. Or Alan Whiteman, who lost his 88-year-old mum in May. He said yesterday that a public inquiry should have started in June, and that this report doesn't provide the answers that he needs. For six months, grieving families like the O'Neills, like the Whitemans, have had no answers, and they're not satisfied with this report, and nor are we. So will the First Minister give these families the respect they deserve and order Public Health Scotland to go back and fill in the blanks? First Minister. I, I said yesterday we would be taking forward further work and asking Public Health Scotland to do further work. Um, I, I'm sure Public Health Scotland, but also the independent academics who contributed to this report would be willing uh, to do what they did with journalists yesterday and meet with any members across the chamber to explain their methodology, how this report was conducted and the limitations of the methodology, which nobody has ever shied away from. We will continue to do whatever work is required. Um, I, uh, on grieving families, um, I, I don't expect any grieving family to think that they have all of the answers to the questions they have in, in this report. I, I want to do everything we can to provide those answers, but also to make sure that there is full learning and accountability in due course. Um, these grieving families and what happened with care homes is probably the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning and the last thing I think about before I go to sleep. That is no comfort to anybody who has lost a loved one. My condolences to them and my regret at uh, what they have suffered knows no limits. Uh, the commitment I have to them each and every day as we continue to guide this country through the pandemic is to learn lessons, apply lessons, take whatever action is necessary to keep people safe and to go through a process that allows as far as possible, given what we have been and continue to deal with, the answers to the questions that they have. And I will continue to do that to the best of my ability for every moment that we are in this situation. Thank you. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can we send our condolences to uh, all the families uh, of all of those uh, who have lost loved ones um, at any point during the course of this pandemic? And can we also extend our thanks to all staff in health and social care for the tireless work that they have done and that they continue to do? Can I thank the First Minister for advance sight of her statement uh, today? In it, it's clear that there are some local communities which are at a lower tier than was predicted, but there are some that, that are at a higher tier than was predicted. Has the government worked out what this decision today means for people's jobs and incomes in those areas which are in the higher tiers? What further consultation will there be in these areas between now and Monday? 
And if these health measures are, in the government's view, proportionate, will the government work to introduce proportionate economic measures to protect jobs, businesses and local public services, especially for those in Tier 3 now and for those that might be in Tier 4 in the future? First Minister. I very much hope, I can't guarantee it, and you heard what I said earlier on, um, but I very much hope that we can avoid any part of the country, let alone the whole country, going into level four, and that, I think, is a responsibility not just for government, but for all of us. Um, I said, and I, I, I'll repeat, we have deliberately taken a cautious approach right now, firstly because the situation here at home and across the UK and Europe is very fragile and we have to recognise that. But secondly, and I hope people uh, will understand this, we are migrating to a new system. Uh, this differentiated approach is not one that we have applied yet in this way. And I think a degree of caution for the first application of that is merited. So there are uh, some areas, I cited the Borders and Argyll and Butte, who are in level one, who could and did make a case that they should go straight into level zero. Uh, and that is something we will consider as we go forward. Um, and likewise, there are parts of the country, Inverclyde, uh, that made a case that they should go into to level two, but the reasons uh, why that is not the case have been set out. I would encourage members to read the paper that we have published, which goes into more detail about this decision making. All of this has an impact on jobs, public services and livelihoods, and I am acutely aware of that. But what will have a bigger impact on jobs and services and livelihoods is if we don't control this virus. We only have to look across Europe right now um, at Germany, at France last night, going into full nationwide lockdowns again. Uh, that is what we want to avoid. And this is our best chance of doing that. Uh, we have set out support that will be available for businesses. They will, that will apply to businesses that are either closed or have restricted trading, regardless of what level they are in. And information is available on the website I mentioned earlier on. Uh, the replacement job support scheme comes into place next week as well, uh, run by the UK government. I and I think Richard Leonard and I are in agreement about this. That should go further, uh, but it is there for businesses to take account of. We are providing as much business support as we can within the resources we have available, and we will continue to work with the UK government to try to extend uh, that further. Uh, but it is right and proper that businesses are supported, but we will do no favours to any businesses if we ease up to an extent prematurely surely that allows the virus to run out of control again because that is a sure and certain route to level four not just for parts of the country but for the whole country and I think all of us want to avoid that. Richard Leonard. Can I thank the First Minister uh, for that answer and let me also turn to the serious question of what has happened in our care homes. Yesterday's Public Health Scotland report shows that 123 patients were discharged from hospital after testing positive. Over 300 patients who were discharged had been in hospital for COVID-19, and thousands of elderly patients were transferred into care homes without being tested at all. First Minister, care homes that took discharges were three times more likely to have outbreaks than those which did not. So are you really comfortable telling the families of those who have lost loved ones that there is no link between your government's decision to discharge people into care homes untested and the tragic outbreaks which then occurred? Um, I, th th that is not what I'm saying, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a, a second, in a moment. Can I just, however, correct an uh, uh, inadvertent error in my last answer to Richard Leonard, where I said that Borders and Argyll and Butte were in level one and argued to go to level zero. Of course, Borders and Argyll and Butte are in level two and uh, made a case or could have made a case to go to, to level one. My apologies for that. Uh, mistake. O on care homes, I am I'm not saying, and the report doesn't say there is no link. Uh, the report says that taking account of all of the factors, uh, hospital discharge uh, was not uh, a statistically significant factor compared to, for example, the size of a care home. That does not mean, and this is a point I laboured to make yesterday and will always make, there were serious outbreaks in care homes. Uh, discharges did not have no effect on that. Um, but there are other factors that we have to consider as well. And at the end of the day, the fact that there was big outbreaks that led to people losing their lives is something that 
I will never be comfortable with, uh, not just as First Minister, but I will never be comfortable with for uh, probably the rest of, of my life. I want to understand this and I want to make sure that we continue to take the action that is uh, necessary to protect older people in care homes. Our position on testing changed, as I said, in line with advice and evidence, um, and rightly so. But a key point here, which remains important now, even when we have a much uh, wider approach to testing in care homes, is that the absence of testing, even the presence of testing, should not allow us to ignore the other important things that have to be done. Uh, infection prevention and control in care homes is vital. There was always the emphasis on that, and now testing, of course, supplements the protection that is there. Um, I, and I, I really do sincerely apologise if anybody listening to me at any time thinks in any way I am trying to minimise what happened in care homes. If that's an impression I give, uh, presiding officer, I, I readily say sorry for that because that is not the impression I am trying to give. I am trying to understand it and I am trying to give the public as deep an understanding of this as possible, but I am not and never will try to underplay the severity or the seriousness of what happened and of all of the factors that may, to a large extent or a smaller extent, have played a part in that. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, and, uh, and I hear the First Minister's regret, but we are also looking for her responsibility. Yesterday's report does not tell the full story. The crisis in our care homes didn't just have one cause. The lack of PPE, despite warning after warning. The lack of testing of care home staff, despite warning after warning. Years of underfunding, despite warning after warning. And let me be clear, the drive to clear space and free up beds in our hospitals, the discharge of COVID-19 positive patients and untested patients straight into care homes were all permitted and encouraged by Scottish Government guidance. So families deserve answers. Why did the government apply the precautionary principle to all other areas of the pandemic, pandemic but not to Scotland's care homes? First Minister. Um, I, I, I don't agree with that, but I don't minimise the impact on care homes. And I, I have said it before, I will say it again today, we got things wrong. We didn't get things wrong because we didn't care about care homes. We got things wrong as other countries in the UK and further afield got things wrong in care homes because of uh, underdeveloped understanding at that point of the virus. And also, and I readily, I have done it before, I readily concede that, uh, a significant acute concern uh, that our hospitals were going to be overwhelmed with COVID making them an unsafe place for older people and also the, the requirement therefore being to uh, free up capacity in, in care homes and you know I have rightly been challenged many times before about reducing delayed discharge in hospital in normal times and um, the reason for seeking to do that in COVID times was to make sure that older people were not in hospitals without a necessity to be there as COVID cases were coming in. You know, with hindsight, and I, of, of all the things I, I wish I had right now, I, I wish I'd had then the knowledge that I, I do now. That is not to say that we will not have just got things wrong. Of course we will, but some of what people say we should have done then, I'm afraid is applying hindsight that we didn't have then. So we will continue to take uh, the steps that we can. We will continue to be open and upfront when we get things wrong uh, and we will continue to apply that learning to keep uh, our care homes safe. We are uh, going into, uh, we are in and hopefully uh, in Scotland not going deeper into, but we may be going deeper into a second wave. There is an intense focus, not just on the part of government, but partners across the country to make sure that care homes are as safe as they can be. And we will continue to keep 100% focused on that each and every day. Thank you. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Obviously, nobody will be happy about today's announcement about uh, ongoing restrictions, but we can all see that this is happening uh, at a time when other European countries are moving more in the direction of full lockdown in the face of a second wave. Uh, and as we're all facing up to the dawning realisation that these restrictions or something like them will probably be with us for a long time to come. Uh, it's happening as well at the same time as Boris Johnson's government is uh, giving us all a, a Halloween nightmare with the ending of furlough and its inadequate replacement, meaning that not only large numbers of jobs will be lost, but many people who keep their jobs will see significant reductions 
in their incomes. Even people on minimum wage will lose up to a third of their income. And PPE, astonishingly, will be taxed at 20 per cent, pushing up the cost for frontline businesses and workers. Even in this difficult context, I think we all have a responsibility to urge people throughout Scotland to take these restrictions seriously, to comply with them, to keep one another safe. But the success of that new framework will depend, uh, to a large extent, on enforcement at a local level, and that must mean the resources to do that work. One Scottish local authority leader today on the radio said that the Scottish Government is saying that whether you're in level three or four, there's no additional funding. Is that accurate, uh, First Minister? And will there be additional funding for those local authorities that have to ensure the enforcement action at a local level to make this new framework uh, operate successfully? First Minister. Um, I, I'll try and address that question in full. Can I say, Presiding Officer, and I, I hope nobody takes this the wrong way, I misheard part of Patrick Harvey's question because I was distracted by shouting from uh, the benches over here. And um, I'm trying to address all of these questions in, in full uh, because I think all of them um, deserve uh, answers. Um, on the question of support, I, let me try and give a balanced answer here. I think the support that has been provided uh, by the UK Government is very important and very welcome. Um, I don't think it goes far enough in terms of the move from furlough into the job support scheme. That is a, a, a viewpoint I've expressed previously, and we will continue to argue that with the UK Government, uh, because the, the impact of that deficiency will be felt by workers across the country in the form of reduced pay packets, and that is not anything anybody wants to see. We have put in place a, a grant scheme for businesses that will be closed or have their trading restricted. We are doing that, uh, that matches uh, the, the scheme in England. We are doing that to the maximum of the resources we have. We're probably going, uh, we are going beyond the resources that have been committed uh, to us through consequentials. Uh, we will continue to make the case to the UK government that there should be decisions that uh, make more funding available so that we can pass that on to councils and to businesses. This was a bit of the, the question, my apologies, uh, to Patrick Harvey, I didn't catch fully. If he was asking me about support for local authorities over and above that, and particularly for enforcement, uh, we will continue to discuss that with local authorities. One particular issue we are exploring um, is whether further powers are needed for uh, local environmental health officers, for example. Uh, I think there is a case to be made for that, uh, but the case has also been made by local authorities, which I think is also valid, that that requires additional resources to them to allow those enforcement powers to be properly used. So this remains a dynamic discussion and, and always will do between central uh, Scottish Government and local governments so that we can, as far as we possibly can, make sure they have the resources they need uh, to enforce compliance where necessary and support people to comply as well. Patrick Harvey. Uh, another issue I raised uh, this week which will require local enforcement uh, is that of people being told by their employers not to comply with the COVID rules. We've heard of people being told that they should not install the Protect Scotland app or not keep their phone switched on. Uh, and this is not exceptional. I've heard cases from across the country uh, of employers uh, asking people not to self-isolate uh, or told that if they do, it will be treated as unauthorised unpaid absence. Uh, one person uh, got in touch with me today uh, speaking about someone who works in a well-known chain pub. I won't name them until I've verified this, uh, but a well-known chain pub where the member of staff had been showing symptoms, took a test on the Wednesday, was made to work on the Thursday until the results came back. The results were positive, so they went off work from there. So she had been working with symptoms for two days that staff uh, member worked, uh, the, the, those staff members who worked with her on those two days were not only told to keep working, but were moved around the chain's other pubs because of short staffing. So can the First Minister tell us, does local government, the Scottish Government or Police Scotland, currently have the enforcement powers to take action against irresponsible employers who put their short-term business interests ahead of the safety of their workforce, their customers and the wider community? And does the Scottish Government support the proposals from Unite Hospitality on issues like raising sick pay up to full pay uh, and uh, ensuring regular routine testing for hospitality workers? First Minister. Uh, we'll consider the Unite proposals uh, carefully. Um, on the specific question about enforcement powers, one of the changes uh, 
Patrick Harvey will recall we made some weeks ago uh, now was to give local authorities the powers uh, to take enforcement action against any individual premises that were through whatever conduct uh, raising the risk of transmission and that could include closure of that a particular premise or some restrictions on their ability to trade. So local authorities do have uh, powers of that nature, but of course we keep under review whether there needs to be further extension. Um, I, I equally don't know whether uh, the examples that Patrick Harvey has narrated to the Chamber are verified in any way, so um, I would be very interested to, to know if they, if they can be. Let me be very, very clear. I understand how incredibly difficult this situation is for businesses but any business that was behaving in that way is risking making the situation worse uh, risking restrictions having to be in place for longer risking the health and safety of their workers in the wider community and making the impact on businesses more severe and longer lasting it would be completely and utterly irresponsible for any business to behave in that way and i would appeal to businesses in the interest of themselves and the wider country uh, to abide by all of the the rules and support their staff fully to do so as well and to workers across the country if you are being put under pressure by an employer to act in any of these ways get in touch with your local MSP get in touch with the local environmental health office email me directly because that would be dangerous behavior that we would take steps to ensure is addressed uh, fully and promptly thank you question number four Willie Rennie the government had a rule care workers were told that if they had symptoms of the virus, they should stay away from work, stay away from the care home. They did that to protect vulnerable residents. But the government broke its own rule. It sent hundreds of people with the virus into care homes. I know this is difficult, but it does seem to have been one rule for care workers and another rule for this government. And this is not hindsight, because I warned about it at the time. In all of the carefully chosen words today, I still want to hear from the First Minister that the lesson has been learned, the error has been accepted, and the apology has been made for that error. Will the First Minister say those words? First Minister. I am sorry for any error uh, that I have made in this. I've said that many times before. I'm not carefully choosing my words. I probably don't have the... Um, capacity to do that at, at the moment. I am trying to be as frank as possible um, and we've got things wrong um, and we will continue to try to put that right and we will you know, have all of the normal processes of accountability. The one thing I will always, not through carefully chosen words, through emotion probably more than anything else, uh, rail against is the idea that we were somehow not caring about what happened in care homes. Uh, that does not mean that we didn't get things wrong, but we tried at every point on the basis of the evidence and the advice we had at the time to do the things that we thought were most effective. That at the earlier stage of the pandemic with care homes was around infection prevention and control, um, isolation of residents in their own rooms, the, uh, not having communal activity, taking steps around uh, care home workers. At that time, rightly or wrongly, with the benefit of hindsight, that is absolutely legitimate to question this. But at that time, the advice on testing asymptomatic people uh, and the effectiveness of that was different to how it is today. I, I wish I could turn the clock back in all of this, uh, particularly with care homes, uh, but I can't. What I can do and what I have a responsibility to do is to make sure that we learn these lessons and apply them and get it as right as we possibly can. Will we make more mistakes in this situation? Undoubtedly so, and we will regret them as well. But I you know, promise everybody across the country that every single day I will do my best to get it right and my government will do our best to get it right. And we will be scrutinised. I will listen to all of the, the criticisms and scrutiny. It's an important part of this process. Um, and at every step of the way, we will do everything we can to keep people as safe as we possibly can. That is true of the population, and it is particularly true of those most vulnerable. Willie Rennie. Yeah, I didn't challenge on the motives. It's the facts and the decisions that we all want to get to, and that's the purpose of this scrutiny. This complicated statistical report is limited. It's limited because of the lack of testing which means the margins of error are wide. It must not be the end of the investigation of the care home travesty. For the sake of the families, we need to know more. We need to learn as the virus is still with us. 
After the Nike conference, the government was able to establish whether the strains of the virus had spread around the country. Will that work be done for care homes? And we need to know what is happening now. We need to know that all new residents have had two negative tests before they are admitted to care homes. Is that always the case? Uh, that is uh, what we uh, say should happen. I, I recognise that in a big system, I cannot stand here and say 100% that there is never any circumstance in which a policy is not applied. But that is the policy and that is what we expect to be applied. The other thing, and this is reflected in the report, there will always be circumstances where a clinician for good clinical reasons, perhaps a frail elderly patient is at the end of their life, will decide that it is not an appropriate thing to do uh, to conduct an invasive test on that person. And that is something I cannot countermand the decision of a clinician on. But the policy is very, uh, very clear. On uh, uh, my apologies, Willie Rennie's point about um, genomic sequencing, yes, I would expect genomic sequencing to tell us much more about the spread of the virus across the country, including the situation in care homes. Uh, Scotland is probably doing more genomic sequencing than many countries. It did tell us um, a lot of important things about what happened and actually what didn't happen after the Nike conference. Uh, I, I expect there will be more findings from genomic sequencing uh, over uh, the next period that we'll look at the situation uh, over the summer and then what happened as we came out of lockdown. So that does have an important part to play, including in, in care homes. Um, and lastly, on the report, um, and, and should I just in uh, response to something, I, I'm not complaining about scrutiny, uh, not at all. And again, you know, if I ever sound as if I am, that is not my intention. It's an important part of the process we're all going through right now. I have never said this report is the final word. It is obviously limited. It was looking at a particular factor and there are limitations in what it can say around that factor. I have never tried to say otherwise, but there was a, a call for us to commission a report into this particular factor and that's what we did. There are other factors we have to understand more and then in the fullness of time through a full public inquiry, we have to look at the situation in totality. Um, and I am absolutely you know, clear in my mind that that has to happen. It has to happen for the country overall, that has to happen for everybody, not just families of residents in care homes, but particularly them, has to happen for their sake, uh, for, for the res families of those who died. And it has to happen so that we learn lessons now that can be applied if the world, hopefully not in our lifetimes, is ever going through a situation like this again. And I am 100% committed to that process. But right now, my main duty as First Minister is to continue to lead the country in a very focused way through the second wave that still lies ahead of us. Thank you. Just to remind members, I'm going to take the supplementary questions after question seven. Uh, and I would also note that there are well over two dozen, I think well over 30 potential supplementaries, which I don't think we'll get through, but we can try. Question number five, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister what a response is to the report by the Scottish Children's Report Administration and Barnardo Scotland, which confirms that child sexual exploitation is happening in island, rural and urban communities across the country, with cases being reported in 27 out of 32 local authority areas. First Minister. Uh, child sexual abuse and exploitation are heinous crimes. Uh, we welcome the publication of this important research examining the complexity of sexual exploitation and its links to other forms of abuse. The research demands close attention from all core agencies and key partners in determining an appropriate multi-agency response. Any child or young person, regardless of their age, race or ethnicity, can be at risk. It can affect children from any background in any community. Uh, we want, I know all of us want, Scotland to be a place where sexual exploitation of children and young people is eliminated. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that reply. The report has many disturbing findings. For example, that more than half of girls and a quarter of boys involved in the children's hearing system were victims of sexual abuse, with a high proportion of these young people, particularly girls, having attempted suicide. Worryingly, four out of five boys and a quarter of girls identified as likely victims had not been recognised, suggesting that vulnerabilities are not being taken seriously enough. Given these concerns and their magnitude, will the Scottish Government deliver a sustained focus on child sexual exploitation to, to deliver the better protection our most vulnerable children so urgently need? First Minister. 
Uh, along with our third sector partners and through the continued funding uh, commitments to the child protection sector, uh, we will continue to build on the wealth of activity which is delivered through the Nat National Action Plan to prevent and tackle child sexual exploitation. Uh, we have listened carefully to child protection partners uh, when last year uh, they called for the recognition of stronger links uh, to be made between child sexual exploitation and other forms of child abuse. Um, and that is why we will take forward a renewed focus on child abuse and exploitation as part of the revision of the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Strategy. Question number six, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether all flu vaccinations will be completed on time. Uh, yes, health boards are on track to provide eligible cohorts in phase one with the vaccine by the time the flu season reaches uh, its peak. The eligible cohorts are those most clinically vulnerable to flu. Amongst others, they include the over 65s, those with underlying health conditions, pregnant women and health and social care workers. Uh, health boards have estimated that uh, over 1 million uh, people, almost 1.1 million people, will be vaccinated by the end of this week. That's 44 per cent of the total people who will receive the vaccine during this flu season. Uh, the flu season in the UK begins in December and reaches its peak in January and February. Um, however, it will be possible to receive the vaccine as late as the end of March 2021. Michelle Ballantyne. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Um, when I asked you previously whether you could guarantee that everyone due a flu vaccine will receive one and what percentage you hope to achieve by the end of November, you weren't able to offer the guarantee. But the Health Secretary did write to me to give me that figure of 1,072,237, which she said would be vaccinated by the end of October, or 52 per cent of the people in that phase one group. Since then, we have had further reports of hundreds of patients in Grampian being turned away for flu jabs this month due to major logistical and capacity issues, while Ayrshire and Arran NHS suspended their programme and are unable to vaccinate their care staff. Now, Ms Freeman said yesterday that she doesn't think this is shambolic, but many of our constituents do at the moment disagree with that. So can you tell me how many in the phase one group in each NHS health board have received a flu jab as of today and provide reassurance that I won't need to ask this question again in November? First Minister. Um, I don't have the information for all health boards in front of me. And I, if I did, President Officer, I think it would probably take too long for me to give it uh, and you would get uh, unhappy with me um, or more unhappy with me. But um, the Health Secretary will write to the member with that. Uh, I can say, though, as I said uh, in my initial answer, but I'll give it uh, more precisely than I did, that 1,072,786 people will be vaccinated by the end of this week, which is... Uh, the end of October. Uh, that's 44 per cent of the total people who will receive the vaccine uh, during the flu season and the vaccination programme will continue. Uh, there have been uh, some challenges in health boards, particularly in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, in Ayrshire and Arran. Uh, there was a, a very temporary issue, which was to do with procurement of vaccine, as I understand, um, which has been resolved. I've got many uh, friends and family living in Ayrshire and Arran because that's the part of the country I come from. Uh, I know that that uh, programme in Ayrshire and Arran is generally working uh, very well. Where there are issues, the Health Secretary has been uh, and her officials have been working with health boards to address them and the vaccination programme is on uh, track and we will continue to ensure that that remains the case. Number seven, Claire Baker. Um, thank you. To ask, the, sorry, to ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is responding to reports that BIFAB is on the brink of collapse. Minister. In order to save BIFAB from closure back in 2017 and uh, at that time to support delivery of the Beatrice offshore wind project, uh, the Scottish Government invested £37.4 million through a combination of equity and loan facilities and uh, this was converted to a 32.4 per cent equity stake in BIFAB. Uh, a loan facility of £15 million has also been provided to support working capital. Uh, we will continue to do absolutely everything we can to support the business, uh, while recognising the need for us to remain in line with state aid regulations and uh, overall uh, financial constraints. Uh, in doing this, we remain in regular dialogue with the majority shareholder, JV Driver. Claire Baker. Um, President Officer, today the Daily Record reports on legal opinion regarding state aid rules from Lord Davidson, which concludes that the government have appeared irrational in withdrawing the commitment to providing a guarantee and that this decision risks judicial review. 
Communities in Fife cannot understand why the Scottish Government have withdrawn their support, and I urge the First Minister to reverse the decision and to publish the advice she has received on state aid. 500 jobs in Fife rely on this contract, and a workforce who marched on this Parliament three years ago deserves straight answers and a future. First Minister. Um, well, I uh, sympathise absolutely with the sentiments of Claire Baker's question. This government has uh, worked uh, very hard with the trade unions who have worked even harder and uh, with uh, owners at BIFAB to try to secure it. Uh, we have invested heavily. Um, we have to act within the advice we get on state aid and financial constraints. What I would say to Claire Baker, because I want to be very clear, we will leave no stone unturned. I would, I would ask Claire Baker to to recognise this and, and perhaps take it as a sign of the, the, the sentiment that lies behind the Scottish Government's actions here. We have invested significantly. We are a significant shareholder in BIFAB. It would make no sense for the government, let alone the workers of the wider community, for us simply to allow BIFAB to go to the wall if there is a way for us to avoid that happening. So we will be exploring every opportunity to try to save BIFAB, as we have done in the past. As people would expect, in my position, I have personally uh, spent a great deal of time and effort working with others to try to secure BIFAB. But for that, BIFAB would have closed three years ago. We will continue to do everything we can, but we have to operate within the legal constraints that all governments are bound by. Thank you very much. And again, we just highlight we seem to have a remarkable number of members wanting to ask supplementaries today. Uh, we, we won't be able to get through them all, but we will go through as many as we can. I would urge people to remember my injunction for succinct and brief questions and answers. Shona Robison, who joins us remotely. Shona Robison. Thank you. I'm sure the First Minister will understand the local concerns that Dundee has been placed in level three. Can the First Minister give any further detail on support for businesses in Dundee affected by this change? And does she share my alarm at the forecast in today's document that NHS Tayside will exceed hospital bed capacity within six weeks on current trajectories? And therefore, what more can we all do to change that trajectory and blunt the rises so Dundee can move out of level three at a future review. Minister. Second officer, can I just say, first of all, you're in charge of the chamber, but I'm happy to answer all of the questions and stay here for as long as it takes to do that, if uh, that is permissible uh, by you. Uh, turning to Shona uh, Robinson's questions, um, I, the, the projections around NHS Tayside are part of the reason we have taken the decision today um, around Dundee City. This is action designed to take uh, Tayside and Dundee in particular off the path it is currently on and avoid these projections uh, coming to pass. And my uh, plea to people across uh, Dundee, but also the wider Tayside region, is to abide strictly by all of the advice, all of the regulations, in order that these uh, decisions and the uh, actions that we have taken have the best possible chance of working. The support for businesses is set out in general terms in the strategic framework. Uh, businesses in Dundee will be able to uh, ask the City Council for precise details and the website uh, findbusinesssupport.gov.scot, if I've not got that uh, wrong, is available for businesses to look in more detail at the support that is available to them should they require to close or have their trading restricted. Thank you. And just for information, the session today is due to end at 13.40 at 20 to 2 and we do resume at half past two. So there's not a huge amount of time for a turnaround and there's a lot of business to get through. Brian Whittle to be followed by Joanne Lamott. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister if she will give assurances that wholesalers who are not closed but severely restricted by the closure of ho the hospitality sector will get access to the hardship fund and additional tar targeted sector support so as to ensure the wholesale food supply chain does not fail and it can continue servicing hospitals, schools, prisons, care homes and hospitality businesses when they reopen? First Minister. Uh, the support package that we have made available is designed to uh, support not just businesses that are required to close uh, or businesses in a primary sense that uh, have their trading restricted, but to support the supply chain uh, as well, and, and therefore that includes uh, wholesalers. Uh, obviously, the precise details of uh, the support packages uh, are available uh, for businesses uh, to consider, uh, and we've tried to match uh, the grant uh, support packages that have been made available in England as well. I think this is the minimum that businesses can expect from government. It's the maximum that we can do within the resources we have, uh, but we will continue to work with our colleagues across the UK uh, to ensure that we see expanded and appropriate support, support for businesses as we continue to go through these difficult times. 
Joanne Lamont to be followed by Bob Doris. Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware that many services available pre-COVID were withdrawn during the early stages of the crisis, including care for older people and disabled people in their own homes. A number of constituents have contacted me to report that, now that services are being reintroduced, their package of support are much reduced, with a consequent serious impact on their health and well-being. Does the First Minister agree that any attempt to reduce support now that pre-COVID was deemed essential is unacceptable? And what action will she take to ensure that support is not reduced by stealth, with the impact of COVID being suggested as a justification? First Minister. Um, yes, I do agree with that. And I think the Health Secretary has made that clear uh, previously, that people should have the support that they require and that COVID should not be used as an excuse to reduce, uh, to use Joanne Lamont's phrase, uh, packages by stealth. Um, that I don't think that is happening uh, across the country. I have heard uh, reports of it happening in particular parts of the country and uh, the Health Secretary has engaged with uh, local partners where that is the case. There has also been additional investment from the Scottish Government uh, to local partners to ensure that these services uh, have the, the support they need. So if any member has any uh, evidence of that happening in any part of the country, if they draw it to the attention of the Health Secretary, we will take steps to address it. Thank you. Bob Doris to be followed by Liz Smith. Bob Doris. Officer, I know that many MSPs have been contacted by local amateur football teams, and a local amateur football team in my constituency, Maryhill Milan, who were formed in 2017, supported many players, including those in the recovery community. Under Level 3 restrictions, they cannot play the game they love, and I'm sure everyone in the Chamber will appreciate the potential impact on the health and well-being of those players. I absolutely accept the tough decisions and the balance the Scottish Government must strike at this difficult time. But can I ask the First Minister what consideration can be given in the future to developing a more flexible framework that can see teams such as Mirahill Milan get back playing as quickly, but just as importantly, as safely as possible? First Minister. Well, I think we all appreciate the positive benefits that participation in football and, and sports generally has on uh, physical and mental health. Um, and also on a range of other outcomes, including recovery. And that's demonstrated, of course, by the activity of Mary Hill Milan and Bob Doris's constituency. Um, I know that the restrictions on adult contact sport will disappoint people who can't get together with their pals and teammates to play at whatever support, sport it is that they favour. Uh, after very significant consideration and consultation, though, the Scottish Government has reluctantly confirmed the position as previously set out, as the risk associated with the virus is still too great in areas with level three or level four conditions to allow adult contact sport. But I want to uh, assure Bob Doris and others that we will keep this situation under review. Uh, nobody wants to restrict anything uh, without that being necessary or for longer than is necessary. And I think that is particularly true of sporting activity. So we will continue to review it and update as and when uh, we are able to do that. Liz Smith, be followed by James Kelly. Uh, thank you. First Minister, can I warmly welcome the £2 million that the Scottish Government gave to the outdoor education sector, um, but can I ask what further engagement the Scottish Government is having with the sector about the long-term sustainability, because obviously the £2 million is uh, not enough to get them through the considerable concerns that they are facing with COVID-19. First Minister. Uh, we are acutely conscious that short-term support is short-term support, and we need to work with all sectors and consider the support that is appropriate and necessary as this situation further develops. We will have ongoing engagement with the outdoor education sector. That engagement has been good and has indeed resulted in the short-term support that Liz Smith uh, welcomes. Uh, we want to, and this has been the case all along, uh, support in the, the short to medium term the sector to do as much as can be done within current regulations to maximise uh, their activity, uh, but also work with them and others within the broad framework we set out to reduce levels of the virus so that we can start to introduce more normality. This is not easy for anybody, but we will continue to work uh, with sectors to provide as much support as we can. And all of us, I think we've all got to remember, you know, because relevant to the previous question and to this one, uh, this can feel and is very difficult for everybody here. A, a quick glance across Europe right now shows that we are not alone here. But the key point is the, the more effectively all of us act to get the virus under control, the more quickly we can start to restore normality. And that really has to be the key point that all of us remember and communicate uh, to our constituents across the country. James Kelly to be followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, First Minister. Can I draw... Uh, sorry, thank you, President Officer. Can I draw the First Minister's attention 
to research published yesterday from the Scotland in Lockdown project based at Glasgow University. They highlighted the plight of forgotten shielders, that's those on the official shielding list that have had to shield because of long-term health conditions or disabilities. One particular problem uh, was access to supermarket deliveries and even when they got access, uh, it was getting the appropriate food uh, consistent with their conditions. So as we enter phase two, can I ask the First Minister what discussions can be had with supermarkets to ensure that those in this situation get the appropriate access to the food that they require in these challenging circumstances? Minister. We'll continue to keep that under ongoing discussion with supermarkets. Of course, at the outset of the pandemic, there were particular pressures on uh, supermarkets, which led to supply issues, and that uh, included uh, delivery slots. Um, that eased, although we also took action to set up um, a, a specific food delivery service for people in the shielding category. And of course, local authorities set up local uh, arrangements to make sure uh, that people in the shielding category got that priority access uh, to food. And thousands of people got the, the free uh, food deliveries every week through the, the, the Scottish Government scheme that uh, we set up. We also did some work with supermarkets to give priority access to slots. Uh, for, for vulnerable people. So we will, hopefully we will not see the same pressures uh, going into the next period as we saw at the outset, but we will continue to talk to supermarkets uh, to make sure that they are addressed where they arise, but also that we are taking steps in partnership with local authorities to ensure that vulnerable people get access to any support that they need, including, where necessary, access to food supplies. Thank you. Willie Coffey to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you. Can I ask the First Minister what the target time is for our contact tracers and our test and protect teams? Contact someone who has received a positive test result so that the test and protect app can be updated as quickly as possible. First Minister. Uh, people who test positive uh, should be contacted within 24 hours of the the positive test being uh, entered into the, the case management system. Uh, the system has been under pressure in recent weeks due to the increasing volume of index cases, but uh, the system is routinely exceeding the 80% target for closure of cases. That means uh, not just uh, initially being contacted, but all of the work being done uh, within 72 hours. Uh, the latest published statistics show that for the week ending 25th October, 84.1% had their interview complete within 24 hours of an index case appearing in the case management system, and that 97.7% of cases were closed within 72 hours of being created in the system. So these are, uh, I think, comparatively with uh, other systems elsewhere, we are uh, positive statistics, but we're not complacent about them. Uh, we'll continue to work hard to make sure they don't deteriorate and that we improve them even further. Thank you. Oliver Mundell to be followed by Colin Smith. Hi, thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister agree to expand the Ministerial Code investigation in, to include her statements to Parliament and her actions on the legal advice regarding the judicial review into Alex Salmond's alleged behaviour? First Minister. Um, I, uh, my, my view right now is that the, uh, James Hamilton, who is the uh, advisor uh, undertaking the investigation into the Ministerial Code, is not restricted at all in the issues he can look at. If he thinks there are any issues that engage the Ministerial Code or in any way could uh, constitute a breach of the Ministerial Code, uh, my view is that he is free to look at them. If he considers that requires any change to his official remit, I'm sure he is uh, perfectly able to, to say that. But just for the record and to be clear, I do not consider uh, his remit uh, to be limited to just one aspect of the Ministerial Code. Colin Smith to be followed by David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, there are many pubs across my region that don't sell food. They don't have space for a beer garden. They can't therefore sell alcohol. But because of the restriction levels the First Minister has just announced, frankly, they'll close. Uh, the government's not yet shared the regulations that will underpin those restrictions yet. So can I ask the First Minister, will those businesses be legally required to close? And if not, will they be treated exactly the same way in terms of the level of financial support from the Scottish Government and access to the furlough scheme as businesses that are legally required to close? If not, why not? Because government restrictions do have the same effect on those businesses as legal closure. Surely they're entitled to the same level of support. First Minister. Um, 
Yes, I uh, I agree that we have to support all businesses, not just those that are legally required to close. The uh, job support scheme uh, does that uh, by having different strands for businesses that are required to close and those that are not. Uh, our own uh, grant uh, system also recognises that businesses that are not required to close but have their trading restricted are also eligible for uh, support. It's, it's important that we recognise the different ways in which these restrictions impact on the ability of businesses to not, uh, operate normally. Uh, we are trying through this system to have as proportionate approach as possible. Um, many countries, right, increasing con numbers of countries, including within the UK right now, Wales, obviously, for uh, reasons that uh, I entirely support, because uh, the, the First Minister there thought uh, they were necessary. Hospitality is completely closed. We see that now in uh, Belgium, France, Germany, um, and increasing uh, numbers of countries. We are trying to be proportionate and give proportionate support, but it is necessary that these kinds of restrictions are complied with to avoid the need for us to do what other countries are doing. And I think that is a, a point that we cannot lose sight of, uh, however difficult I know these restrictions are. Thank you. David, David Torrance, to be followed by Ross Greer. David Torrance, who joins us remotely. Oh, he's here, sorry. David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what role the lack of capital investment by a majority shareholder of Bifab, JV Driver, had on a recent decision to withdraw their bid for the NNG contract. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government is a minority shareholder in Bifab. Um, I set out the uh, shareholding in response to Clare Baker's question. Uh, and we are bound by state aid rules. We can only act as a commercial investor uh, would in our situation. Uh, we look, of course, to JV Driver, the majority shareholder, to provide financial support to the business. Uh, they are maintaining at this stage a zero risk position. Um, and if the majority shareholder is not prepared to invest in the business, it makes it more challenging to demonstrate that another commercial investor would invest. Um, of course, that changes if the majority shareholder is prepared to invest in the company that potentially opens the, the door for the Scottish Government to provide further support. Um, we will continue to do everything we reasonably can to support BIFAB. We wouldn't have uh, come this far uh, with the scale of investment we have already made in BIFAB uh, just to uh, blithely let it uh, go to the wall now. Uh, so we will continue to do what we can, uh, but we are bound by state aid rules and, of course, the broader financial context. Ross Greer is before by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In August, the Deputy First Minister confirmed that by October, the enhanced surveillance testing programme for schools would be fully operational. Did the First Minister confirm if that's now the case and if the aggregate data produced by this testing programme will be published? Um, I, sorry, I, I will come back to Ross Greer on the plans for publication of uh, data. There is um, a, a number of strands to, to testing work in schools. All. Um, Teachers and indeed all school staff can access testing if they fear they have been exposed to the virus. There is also surveillance uh, testing. There, is also been a, there is a, an antibody testing programme uh, that is also being conducted in schools as well. Uh, but I don't have the data on the numbers of that uh, to hand at the moment, but I will undertake to come back to Ross Greer with the detail as soon as possible. Lee MacArthur to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, along with the island authorities, Beatrice Wishart and I have been raising concerns about the continued restrictions on small indoor meetings in Orkney and Shetland. Meeting socially outdoors is simply not possible as we, for many as we enter uh, winter in island communities where restaurants, cafes and coffee shops are pretty thin on the ground. Uh, how was this factored into the Scottish Government's decision? And given the known social harms and the risks of isolation, will the First Minister ensure that every effort is made to lift those restrictions at the earliest possible opportunity? First Minister. Um, Yes, I, I will give that assurance. I said in my remarks earlier on, we do hope, I, I'm not going to give a guarantee ahead of the, the formal assessment, but we hope that we'll be able to lift that for level one areas at the next review point. Um, I do understand the particular difficulties for the island and indeed rural communities, and I recognise that in my statement. The clear public health advice that has come to us at the moment, that given the overall fragility of the system, given that there has been uh, cases in uh, our island communities and our rural communities, although transmission generally is lower, um, and given that we are migrating to this system for the first time, the precautionary and safe thing to do is to keep that restriction in place for a further period. Um, Shetland, uh, as I said earlier on, is the only health board area that doesn't have cases uh, today, and therefore I know this is particularly harsh uh, for Shetland. But we do want to move away from this, all other things being equal, as quickly as possible. And I would hope it is one of the changes we can signal at the next review point. 
Christine Graham to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, as you know, I represent three mining communities, Pennycook, Gorebridge and Newton Grange, home of the Scottish Mining Museum, and so welcome the announcement yesterday of a general pardon by the Scottish Government for those in Scotland criminalised for the events in the 1984 strike. And I know the Government wants, to, the, wants the UK to hold an inquiry. Can I ask that the First Minister emphasises that any UK inquiry must have as part of its remit the issue of whether there was political interference in police operations which saw mounted police charging into minors, democratically defending their jobs and communities. Um, can I thank Christine Green for the question? The minor strike was one of the most bitter and divisive industrial disputes in living memory, and I'm really glad and, and proud that the Scottish Government uh, was able to take a small but important step yesterday in righting those wrongs and addressing the injustice that was suffered by uh, so many miners and their families uh, during that strike. Uh, there are unanswered questions about the UK Government's role in the strike. Uh, we will continue to press them to hold a full public inquiry, which of course would include any uh, allegations of political interference. Uh, for our part, we initiated the independent review to ensure that the experiences of Scottish mining communities were fully understood. We have an opportunity now to bring reconciliation to miners and to police officers and to try to heal the wounds of the past. And we will call upon the UK Government to adopt the same reconciliation approach in taking forward a UK-wide inquiry. Thank you. Alexander Stewart, to be followed by Alec Rowley. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Following a wave of public discontent, the Scottish Government has performed a U-turn on fire and smoke alarm standards. The Housing Minister confirmed to a parliamentary committee that it was, and I quote, imperative to get the publicity right. In reality, a marketing campaign by a private company occurred, which carried the Scottish Government logo, which was not signed off by Scottish Ministers. Therefore, First Minister, what reassurances can you give to constituents in my region and organisations like Age Scotland that lessons will be learned? First Minister. Well, the logo shouldn't have been used, and we've taken steps to ensure that that won't happen um, again. I, I know uh, the, the upset that will have caused to, to people across uh, the country. I first saw the leaflet when it went through the door of uh, a member of uh, my own family who told me um, about it, uh, and many people got that. But more substantively, um, you know, I, I could equally sort of frame this as the Scottish Government has, has listened and recognised the unique circumstances we're in. COVID has meant that we weren't able to do uh, the, the awareness raising and the supportive work that would have made a, a shift to this on the uh, anticipated timescale possible. So we've done, I think, the, the right and responsible thing, which is recognise that, listen to the concerns that people have had and propose that we delay the introduction of that. And, and we'll continue to try to, to respond in that responsible way to all of the difficult issues that are being thrown up by this unique and unprecedented set of circumstances that we're living through. Uh, as members can see, I'm just letting this session run on a, a little bit longer to try and get some more questions in. Alec Rowley to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, President Officer. You will recall that I have previously raised at First Minister's questions and with Ministers the case of my constituent, Leah Collins, a young Scottish mum who, along with her infant son, was sent back to Malta by a Scottish judge to face a risky and uncertain future. It now appears that important issues relating to the case were not uh, known to the Scottish judge before he made his decision, namely that her former partner had admitted a charge of grievous bodily harm last July, eight months before the hearing at which the judge insisted the former partner was innocent and unproven guilty in Malta. This young woman and her young child have been isolated and alone in one room in a hostel in a foreign country because the legal system did not believe her that she was frightened for her safety and for the safety of her children. They need someone on their side. I am asking the Scottish Government to step up and examine the details of this case. I appreciate that it is a legal matter, but when the law fails children and fails young Scottish mothers, then surely something has gone wrong. Will the First Minister agree to look at the detail of what's happened here? This family needs help to be brought back together and for to be brought back to Scotland. First Minister. Can I thank Alec Rowley for uh, raising uh, this case? Uh, members understand the constraints that I have to operate in when it comes to commenting on decisions of the independent legal system. Can I say from a, a human perspective there are some cases where I find that 
much more difficult than in others. And this is one uh, of those cases. My uh, heart, uh, as the heart of everybody I know, uh, goes out to, to Leah uh, and uh, the circumstances that she finds herself in. I cannot simply cast aside uh, the, the constitutional uh, limitations of, of my role. Uh, but if there is anything I can do uh, to try to uh, allow Leah to, to be home uh, and to be safe, then I, of course, will look at doing that. If Alec Rowley wants to, to write to me, then I'm happy to engage and I'm happy to look to see whether there is anything I can do within the obvious constraints that I operate within. Thank you. John Mason to be followed by Morris Golden. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I think the First Minister will be aware that there's a lot of concern about fireworks this year, especially as some of the larger and council displays uh, have been cancelled. She probably also knows that the Dogs Trust are in my constituency and the animals get extremely uh, stressed and frightened when fireworks are let off near to them. Uh, can she make any comments or advice to households and individuals who are thinking about fireworks this year? First Minister. Well, actually, the, the need to behave responsibly um, is greater, uh, even greater this year than it is uh, in previous years. I, in the last few years, have had some uh, particularly uh, challenging issues in my own constituency around the irresponsible um, and downright dangerous use of fireworks. So I know only too well the impact on local communities. Uh, Bonfire Night this year is going to, like so many other things, look very different. Uh, many traditional activities are not going to take place. Public firework displays uh, will not happen uh, this year. Um, so that means it's all the more important that individuals uh, do not act irresponsibly or inadvertently in a way that puts them and others at uh, risk. And that's important for uh, human beings, but it is also, as John Mason said, really important for animals, pets and livestock. Um, the public health advice and COVID restrictions uh, must also be adhered to on household gatherings. So let me be very clear. Uh, people should not be having private firework displays in gardens uh, that breach uh, those rules. And generally, people must behave responsibly um, around fireworks. And I, I know the fire brigade and the police will be uh, making sure that they've got the resources to respond appropriately on the night and in the days leading up to it. Morris Golden to be followed by Polly McNeill. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the difficulties many businesses have had in accessing support, will the First Minister back our proposals for a Coronavirus Business Advisory Council to ensure they are at the heart of our efforts to save jobs? First Minister. Um, I said in the debate on Tuesday that we would consider uh, that uh, proposal sympathetically, and that remains the case. Uh, businesses are already at uh, the heart of this. I appreciate that for businesses, for individuals in the circumstances we live in, it might not always feel like that, and I, uh, I readily recognise that. We want to make sure businesses are involved as far as possible in the decision-making process and have an understanding of what uh, drives those decisions. But we want that to be true of wider society as well, trade unions, uh, for example. So yes, we will uh, consider how to take that proposal forward. I said on Tuesday that although for uh, reasons that we explained then we weren't able to vote for the Conservative or the Labour amendment, that did not mean there weren't good ideas in them and we will take forward those good ideas as far as we can. And Polly McNeill. Mohammed Asif came to Scotland in the year 2000 from Afghanistan as a refugee. He's made a huge contribution to Scotland, including adopting seven-year-old Sudi after a gas explosion. I know this man is also known to the First Minister. He recently visited his very sick mother in Pakistan, but on his return to Glasgow Airport, he was detained by police, closely interrogated, and asked to read Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act. He was asked such questions as what he thought of the Taliban, was he a strict Muslim, and his phone was interrogated with pictures and data. He felt deeply humiliated and degraded. First Minister, this isn't just about Muhammad Asif. This is about a process that seems to me that I wondered if the First Minister agreed that this does tend to undermine our approach in welcoming refugees and re re race community relations. Treating people like Mohammed Asif as a terrorist, while well, he was, uh, what well, was widely known that he fled the brutality of the Taliban, should be condemned. And perhaps it's time to review how the services go about. Uh, profiling people who they detain. First Minister. Um, can I thank Polly McNeill for raising this? I should uh, 
declare an interest, uh, Mohamed Asif is a very dear friend of mine, as I know he is of uh, Pauline McNeill. He is a fine, upstanding uh, member of the Scottish community, he makes a marvellous contribution to this country, and uh, we should all be really proud uh, to have him here as well, of course, as uh, little Sadez, uh, who has come through the most uh, unimaginable trauma, but is also uh, flourishing. Uh, but this, as Pauline McNeill says, is uh, obviously about his experience, but it's a wider issue. I've uh, not had the chance to speak to him this week, but I've read uh, the reports of what he experienced, and I think it is uh, unacceptable, and I, I, I do think uh, things need to change. Let me also say that people who work for Border Force and Immigration Authorities, they do a tough job, and we should recognise that too. But there are many people, many of my constituents in the south side of Glasgow, who uh, travel uh, backwards and forwards to countries like Pakistan, who fear, feel that they are not treated fairly um, in that process, um, and that they are often put through very uh, humiliating and degrading experiences and I do think that is wrong um, and so we have to find the right balance between protecting the country and recognising uh, the, the fact that people like Mohammed Asif should not be uh, treated in that way. These are reserved matters but we continue to raise them uh, with the UK government as appropriate. Thank you very much and I'm afraid although I've let it run on I don't think I'm able to let this uh, session run any further. Sorry, point of order from Joanne Lamond. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, on a point of order in relation to the role of MSPs in interrogating the work of, of, of the Scottish Government, I note your willingness to extend this session, and I note in particular respect the willingness of the First Minister to continue answering questions. But I think we all must accept there is a serious problem with MSPs being able fully to explore all of the issues, COVID and non-COVID, in this one session. And I wonder if it would be in order for me to suggest that part of the challenge is to include such a significant statement as today's alongside FMQs. And could I ask that the presiding officer will have the Bureau consider um, separating off any statement on progress on levels of restrictions, some of which I, I understand have been looked at daily, to separate that from FFQs, um, allowing more questions to be raised, and with perhaps a statement being made on Tuesday. And would the Bureau further consider the role of COVID, uh, the COVID committee in considering how it might engage in these serious issues with the First Minister? Can I thank Joanne Lamont for her point of order? Uh, I would note that there are, there are still more than a dozen members who have not been able to, uh, who have not been able to make a contribution, uh, who wish to ask a question of the First Minister, uh, and uh, for whom we haven't been able to schedule time today. Uh, this is very much a matter of ongoing d debate at the Bureau at the moment. Uh, I would suggest to Joanne Lamont that she puts her uh, proposal through her business manager, but I will also note it and bring it to the Bureau. I would just remind all members that at the moment, uh, one second, point, point, points of order are for, for my, me to answer. Um, I would just remind all members that at the moment, uh, the Parliamentary Bureau is leading a specific piece of work on the process of parliamentary scrutiny given the stage we're at in the, our response to COVID. So we have actually appealed to all members to bring forward suggestions just as this and it's spe specifically about making sure we allocate enough parliamentary time so that members can raise issues on behalf of their constituents. So this is very much, this is actually on the agenda for Tuesday and I'll take uh, Ms Lamont's specific suggestion to the, the Bureau. The, the First Minister would also like to make a point of order. Well, it's just, I, I did say in my statement, I appreciate there was a lot of information in it, but it is the intention of government to come to Parliament and make a statement each Tuesday if there are changes being made to the levels, because I recognise the limitations of doing it before FMQs. More broadly, um, I appreciate my answers can be lengthy. I'm trying to give as much information, but equally, presiding officer, I am always happy to stay here for as long as possible to answer all of the questions that MSPs have. Now, that is noted, First Minister. I mean, I think it's well appreciated that we've had an hour and a half of this session. Uh, these matters are discussed at the Bureau every week. Uh, I don't want to keep members any longer, but I do want to draw the members' attention to the fact that today is an entirely different note before I suspend proceedings. Uh, today marks Brian Taylor, BBC Scotland's political editor's last day uh, covering uh, our affairs. Uh, many of us here, in fact, all of us here will know Brian very well. He, he has a long and distinguished uh, career in broadcasting. He spent more than two decades now, every moment of our political life here in the Scottish Parliament, covering this institution. Uh, he had done so with authority, with insight, very often with humour and wit. 
Uh, he has been the conduit uh, for many people around Scotland of all our affairs, our deliberations, our decisions and machinations. Uh, I would just like to thank him uh, for the work he has done uh, for, on behalf of the Parliament, uh, on behalf of his, for his contribution to public life and on behalf of the Scottish people. So, thank you. And on that note, I suspend proceedings until half past two.